Welcome everyone. Um, today is the second of the Animal Issues Thematic Clusters interviews, which we are conducting every day in connection with the United Nations High Level Political Forum, which is a virtual event this year um, for the first time due to the ongoing pandemic. Today, we are interviewing Dr. Chini Krishna. Chini is a founder of the Blue Cross of India and a former chairman of the Animal Welfare Board of India. And we will be talking today about creating safe and healthy communities through dog TNVR. TNVR stands for Trap, Neuter, Vaccinate, and Return. Thank you, Chini Krishna, for joining us Thank today. You. So my first question to you is, what is TNVR and why is it important? TNVR uh, stands for, as you said, trap, neuter, vaccinate, and return. In India, we changed that to uh, an AB ABC, which means animal birth control, which is the same thing. And in India, we have been using it primarily for dogs. It's the national policy of India. And a dog killing because of overpopulation is not permitted since 2001. Okay, that's, that's excellent. Um, so what are, what are the main benefits of TNDR as a strategy for controlling dog populations? The, the, the advantage really is, as far as India is concerned, I, I, you know, whatever I say, I'm going to give specific uh, importance to India because in India, rabies was a major problem. And the, the official dog killing program in India started in 1860 at Madras in Chennai. Mm. At that time, they were killing approximately one dog a week. And that meant about 50 dogs per year. And the reason for that was that somebody would complain to either the collector or the commissioner of police that there's a, a biting dog, an aggressive dog, possibly rabbit, in the bazaar, and the collector would go out and shoot it. Uh, very messy to look at, but probably one of the kinder ways in which animals were being killed at that time. The reason for that was to prevent, basically, dog bites to human beings. Uh, but this went on for over a hundred years. And in 1919, the City Municipal Act of Madras made it legal to kill animals, to protect them, to protect the human beings, the residents of Madras, from uh, diseases, it was, that meant zoonotic diseases primarily, and from dog bites. Mm -hmm. So in general, how does the presence of free roaming dog populations impact people, um, both in a negative way and are there any positive benefits to having free roaming dogs in a community? I'll start with the negative aspect because it's very small. The negative aspects today are primarily the chances of accidents in the urban areas. Uh, as far as the positive benefits are concerned, I'll go back to 5,000 years. And for 5,000 years, recorded history of India, man and animals have lived in harmony. And the, the dogs, even though the domestication of the dog goes back to many times longer than 5,000 years, 14,000, 15,000, maybe even 40,000 years, the fact is that for 5,000 years of recorded history in India, Man and animals got along very well. They lived together, there was absolutely no problem. And as far as the dog was concerned, in return for a few scraps from the table, it protected the village by security at night, barking when any outsider came. And very honestly, people realized even at that time, the psychological benefits of keeping a dog. It's amazing. It's a, they are amazing stress busters, and man and dog have lived in harmony all through this. I mean, in many cases, there was a beautiful film that you had made some time back on Yudhishthira, a dog going to heaven with 
Arjuna after the Mahabharata war. That is, that is basically the essence of the way Indians lived in harmony with the dogs. Unfortunately, over the years, uh, it's, I would hate to put it that it, the British were the ones who brought in the dog killing, thinking that the uh, street is no place for a dog. And that is true as far as I'm concerned. I honestly believe that today in the urban setting, a street is really no place for a dog because of the dangers it's exposed to. Every dog requires a loving home. But there are communities where dogs are accepted very well, and it's for these community dogs that the TNBR program started. The benefits of the TNBR program, or the, or the ABC program as we call it, is not really for the animal itself. It is for the human society in which the animals live. We, by our uh, carelessness, allowed them to breed very prolifically and then made this a problem. It was in 1982 or so that the WHO brought out the first guidelines on street animal population control. The reason for the street animal population control, as I said, is not per se for the number of dogs on the street. It's really for the control of rabies in a place like India where rabies is endemic. And that it's been a very good program can be seen from the statistics that I'm going to give you a little later on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so strategically, one element of TNVR, which you call ABC, is the return of the dogs after they are spayed or neutered to the environment in which they are living. Um, what, is the, what is the rationale for this step as opposed to trying to take the dogs off the streets? As you said, a street is no place for a dog. Okay, uh, the reason for that is very simple. Dogs are very territorial in nature, and they, they stick to a marked territory in which they live. If you remove all the dogs from any area, temporarily there would be certainly a drop in the number of dogs in that area. But once the scent of the original dogs disappear, and it's the scent of these original dogs that kept other dogs from coming into this, these areas, new dogs would come in, provided food is available. The Animal Birth Control Program, as it's called for street dogs, is based on two very, very simple laws, which, can't, which are immutable. Number, rule number one, the number of dogs in any area is directly proportional to the availability of food. And rule number two, nature abhors a vacuum. So you remove all the dogs from any area, temporarily there would be a drop in the number of dogs. But as soon as the dogs from the neighboring areas realize that this place is empty, and that food is available, a fresh bunch of dogs will move in. It's to prevent this migration of new dogs into any area that we return the old dogs after the operation, after the sterilization program and vaccination program, so that there's always a set of vaccinated, safe, uh, sterilized animals which will not reproduce and cause uh, any additions to the animal population in that area. Okay. The, Okay, I, I, uh, you see, the, the thing is that for, for many years, there are only three ways in which you can solve the number of animals in any area. One is to remove all the dogs. Number two is to kill the dogs. And number three is to do the ABC program. If we are looking at a humane, sustainable, viable option, the ABC program is the only way to go. And by the way, the reason it's called the ABC program is because it's not, the, it didn't, though it stands for animal birth control, we coined that term to show the municipal authorities, the corporation authorities in India, that control of the street dog population is as simple as ABC. That's, that's creative branding. Um, so you've already partly answered it, um, I think, but, what makes um, ABC more effective at controlling dog populations than culling, um, specifically if one's goal is to control the population and the spread of rabies for human sake rather than solely as an animal welfare issue? What makes ABC more effective? Well, the very fact that, uh, as I told you, the dog killing program in, in, in Madras started in 1860 
which means 160 years ago. It was in 1964 that the Blue Cross of India began to study the, pro the problem created by the dogs on the street. So we began to look more seriously into that and found that over the 120 years till then, that the killing had been going on. The, if the purpose of the killing as per the Municipal Act was to protect the, number, the people of Madras from animal uh, bites and attacks and to control rabies, they failed spectacularly on both counts because as per their own records, it was shown that the number of dogs being killed each year kept going up, the number of dog bites kept going up, and the number of people dying from rabies suddenly kept going up. So obviously a program that hasn't worked over 100 years plus is, is a program that is faulty somewhere. So when we began to study it, we realized that there must, the basic fun problem was that the dogs being removed from the street only led to a fresh bunch of dogs from neighboring areas coming in. So, and uh, the, at that time, Madras was much smaller than it is today. Today, it has a population of over 10 million people. At that time, it was very much less. So from the uh, 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 urban areas, the dogs that were removed, the, the rural areas surrounding Madras began to contribute a large number of new dogs coming in. And this killing went on in perpetuity. As a matter of fact, the WHO uh, introduction to the stray dog uh, management program of, uh, of 1982 said that all too, and I'm quoting, it said all too often, uh, faced with the problems caused by these dogs, the authorities resorted to killing, indiscriminate killing, only to dis discover that the killing had to go on year after year with no end in sight which obviously meant that killing is not the solution. Mm -hmm. The animal birth control program was therefore brought in. And for many years, we fought a major battle with the Chennai Corporation, trying to get them to stop the killing, saying it's not working and the number of rabies cases are going up. We have to do something else. But then there, was very, there were very few people who were willing to listen till the WHO came out with these guidelines. And the WHO came out with those guidelines, by the way, because the Blue Cross had written to them in 1964, saying that we, uh, this is a program that we propose. What do you think about it? It took them 16 years to study the document and come out with the guidelines. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, a note to participants, if you have questions that you would like to ask Dr. Chini Krishna, um, you may submit them using the chat feature and at the end of the interview, I will select some audience questions uh, to, to present. Um, so my next question is actually about the WHO. Could you expand on what the collaboration between the Blue Cross of India and the World Health Organization looked like? We have no formal collaboration or, or cooperation agreement with them. The, we wrote to them because the then head of WHO was Dr. Lakshminsa Modiliar, who happened to be the vice chancellor of my university in which I was studying. I went and met him and I gave him a, a background of what we had thought about as far as the animal birth control program is concerned. He sent it on to Geneva and it was studied there, obviously, and responded to after many, many years. At that time, there was no fax, there was no email and communications were much, much slower. The only way we could communicate was by telephone if you wanted an urgent answer and uh, long distance calls across the seas took a long, long time to get even get through. Mm -hmm. So the WHO, FAO and OIE are today of the same uh, idea that killing has never worked and that it has to be only done with a birth control program and the greatest compliment that the three organizations have paid the Blue Cross is that today, if you look at many of the documents of OIE and FAO and the WHO, they don't even call it the TNVR program anymore. They refer to it as the ABC program. Uh, I don't think we could have a better compliment than that. That is quite a compliment. Um, so would you be willing to share some success stories on the use of ABC in India? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll start off with my own city. 
uh, Madras, today called Chennai. Uh, in 1996, when the ABC program actually was implemented by the corporation after a great deal of difficulty, the number of rabies cases as recorded by the corporation by deaths in hospitals had gone up to 120 per year. The, soon after we brought in ABC in March 2000, uh, 1996, the number of cases the, from the next year itself showed a dramatic drop. Please remember that nothing had changed. The method of vaccination remained the same, which was the 14 injections around the navel. There was no tissue culture vaccines. There were very painful injections. So there were many people who didn't even go through the entire program. But nothing else had changed. No anti-immunoglobulin uh, was given. Uh, no other tissue culture vaccines were available. So from 1996 to 2001, there was a steady decline in the number of rabies cases. From 120, it came down to 30. Mm. After that, it came down even more dramatically. And in 2010, so the three years of zero rabies in Madras City, that's 2008, 2009, 2010. And in 2010, uh, Chennai was officially declared rabies free. Today, there are an odd case of rabies here and there for the very simple reason that the, the outskirts of Madras have expanded tremendously. The population has gone up by three times. The area has gone up by more than four times. Mm. The, the very fact that in 1992 is that communications were not that good. Record keeping was certainly far below what it is today. So a lot of rabies cases would have gone unrecorded because people never even brought the animals to the, hosp uh, the, the victims to the hospital and they died in the villages and they were just buried or, or cremated. Today, if a person dies of rabies, it hits the headlines. Mm -hmm. So we can be sure that if the under-reporting today is a, is a factor of maybe 10%, the under-reporting in 1996 was probably 100%. Mm -hmm. So the fact that ABC has worked, not because of the number of animals being uh, controlled, but because of the uh, rabies part of the vaccinations that we do when we do the animal birth control operation. Obviously, it does work. Madras is not alone in this. The same thing has happened in Bangalore. The same thing has happened in Jaipur. The same thing has happened in Kalimpong. These are three, four places where we have very, very accurate records being kept. But the fact is that the whole of India, for example, according to WHO, there were 30,000 rabies cases in 1996. And even though the WHO website today gives a very high figure. The government of India records, which are fairly accurate, I'm sure there is some under-reporting, but they are fairly, fairly accurate. The number of uh, rabies cases would probably be a maximum of 2,000 today all over India. Mm. That's so maybe the, the, the success stories there are galore. I mean, every state which has gone in for ABC, Kerala, for example, very, very few rabies cases are reported in the whole of Kerala. And Kerala is a state which has a 100% literacy rate. So any case of rabies which occurs over there would certainly find a place in the newspaper. Okay. Are there any places outside India that you believe have implemented ABC or TNVR programs well? Thailand has done it. Uh, Hong Kong has done it. A lot of countries, uh, Sri Lanka has done it, and it was very successful over there. The whole island uh, went, is almost rabies-free. Uh, places like Bali and all that have been doing it. Indonesia, uh, Flores, for example, the island, they have shown that rabies has, could be controlled very easily. And in an island a nation, control of rabies becomes relatively easy because you can prevent infected animals coming in by strict quarantine. Mm -hmm. All over the world is being accepted. Let's face it, uh, TNVR for cats, for feral cats in the US has been a massive success. Nobody was thinking of dogs at that time. The reason we thought of dogs is because of the terribly horrific way in which dogs were being killed in Madras. And in, in the 60s when I was growing up, 
the the most common sign that you could find in sub in the trains and buses and auto rickshaws and public transport was a, an inverted red triangle with the slogan a small family is a happy family so to jump from population control for human beings to population control for animals was not any big quantum leap in thinking mm -hmm. okay um so you mentioned cats. Can ABC be done for species other than dogs and cats that often live in close proximity to humans? Um, has it ever been tried for monkeys, say, or for rodents? Uh, rodents, no. Monkeys, yes. In Simla, for example, in Himachal Pradesh in India, they had set up two laparoscopy clinics which were doing uh, laparoscopic uh, intervention for uh, birth control for monkeys because they, the mon they felt the monkeys were creating a problem over there. For the simple reason, the tourists who come there, to the temples especially, the monkey being an animal that's worshipped in India, people would feed them. And once a amount, large amount of food is available, the, the animals also tend to multiply in proportion. Uh, it has been quite successful over there. Unfortunately, the government has not brought out a policy paper on uh, animal birth control for monkeys, but it certainly works. Mm -hmm. Okay. For rodents, you mentioned, no, very sadly, no. And uh, there are commercial organizations like Senestec who are brought out a thing called Contrapest, I think, for rats. Uh, rats fed on contrapest, uh, the ovarian follicles get uh, degenerated and they stop reproducing. Uh, as, you, as you know, a pair of rats can multiply to over a thousand in one year. So it is a major problem and as far as rats are concerned, I think this, we, we, this is a totally humane method. The animals don't get poisoned or killed. The other ways of killing rats have been terrible. Glue traps and traps and other things. Here, the animal eats it very happily and gets sterile, and they slowly the populations die out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would, if contrapest was implemented in mass, that would be a wonderful thing, both for um, people who are affected by rat rodent populations and for the rodents themselves as an alternative to the crueler methods of control. Um, all right, so we have an audience question from Valerie. Um, when you started the program, did you work only with local veterinarians? And did you vaccinate dogs at the same time as neutering? Yeah, uh, we see, unfortunately, with, when the, we started the Blue Cross, uh, we were met with a lot of opposition from the local veterinarians because they felt that giving free treatment was cutting into their business. So we were not very well received. We had our own veterinarians who were doing this operation. Uh, with the help of the head of surgery from the Madras Veterinary College, one of the oldest veterinary institutes in the world, who used to come and work on weekends totally free, doing the ABC operations, and that's how we started. But uh, today, a lot of local veterinarians do the ABC operations. They, of course, charge quite a bit. Uh, we have started charging from about two years ago, a very token amount of about $7 or so per animal. And uh, it, has been, it has been working out quite well. And today, the veterinarians realize that thanks to the Blue Cross, their business has really gone up tremendously because more and more people are keeping pets and more and more people are taking them for treatment to the veterinarians. We have a question from Dirk. What are or were the biggest problems that the ABC program faced and how were they solved? I'm sorry, what is the? Uh, what are or were the biggest problems the program faced and how were they solved? Okay, the biggest problem really as far as the ABC program is concerned is public perception that the populations don't go down overnight. It does take time 
when you even if you sterilize the entire population, it takes over a year before you notice any decrease in population. When you have done about 70%, the population begins to stabilize. So they begin to realize that they don't see puppies on the road anymore. They don't find a pair of mating dogs. Both of these were very, very common sites 15, 20 years ago in Madras. The major takeaway has really been that it works. It's the, it is certainly much more economical in the long run for municipalities and the government to go in for this. And it is a, no longer a something that has to be tried out. The fact that it was adopted by the Animal Welfare Board of India in 1997 as the official policy of the Animal Welfare Board did give a big boost as far as the Blue Cross, the ABC program was concerned. And at that time, there was nobody else doing it. We were the only people doing it at 1997. Uh, 1996, actually, Jaipur started a program which has been exceedingly successful, more successful than Madras, for a very simple reason. Jaipur is a much smaller area, and they have covered it very well. Do you have, um, since one of the biggest problems with ABC and TNVR programs around the world, which you've alluded to, is the fact that they take time, and that often projects are started or they're done small scale, but they're not continued for long enough or done widely enough to actually have that lasting impact so that the population, the sterilized population reaches 70% and the total population starts to stabilize and go down. Um, and often that's because of um, basically the government losing patience. Do you have any advice for reaching out to governments um, to, yeah, to convince them to continue um, these kinds of programs long enough for them to be successful rather than resorting to calling? You see, the very fact that uh, the government uh, brought out an act in 2001, making it mandatory to uh, only go in for ABC and not for killing anymore, we thought that the problem was solved. But then, un uh, unfortunately, the, the final say lies with the local authorities and the state governments. And unless they begin to implement the act in, in spirit, letter and spirit, it's not going to work. And as I told you before, unless you have done 70% of the animals at least, the population doesn't stabilize. So just doing a token few here and a token few there, like most states are doing today, will not solve the problem. But the problem is really being tackled by NGOs who have taken it on themselves to do this. And they have succeeded to a very large extent. Uh, Bombay has been very, very successful. Uh, Bangalore has been successful. Madras, Jaipur, Kalimpong. Calcutta, there are a lot of groups doing it. In uh, places like Tirupati, which is a pilgrim area, one single organization has managed to bring down the number of rabies cases to zero from a minimum of about 10 per year, even as recently as 10 years ago. Okay, we have a, here's an interesting question from Carolyn. How do you address the issue of food availability, um, for example, in waste management? Yeah, okay, as I told you at the beginning, the success of this program really hinges around two things. One is the available, the entire program, as I told you, is about two things. One is the availability of food, and the second one is the, that nature will not tolerate a vacuum, so removing the dogs doesn't work. Now, if we can control the, the, the food availability, it is uh, going to be a major factor which will reduce the number of animals over there. In India, for example, unless solid waste management is done properly and the garbage is left on the streets and uh, much of this garbage is edible garbage, garbage from hotels and restaurants and roadside eateries, the issue of animals being there because their food is available will remain. We have to be able to control the, there are three things on which the carrying capacity of the environment, the carrying capacity is really defined as the availability of food, water, and areas to rest. The uh, control of the uh, water is going to be difficult. Control of areas to rest in, for a dog, it could be anything under a flyover, under a, a bypass in a unused water pipe in the backyard of houses. 
So what we have to really, the, the easiest thing to control is the availability of food. And if the solid waste management programs in any city are properly done, this would impact very greatly on the requirement for ABC and the bringing down of the animal population. Daniela asks, how is the maintenance of the ABC program in Madras being continued? And how is it so like done? Who's, who's organizing it? Who's continuing and perpetuating the program? Well, we have been doing it since, as I said, since 1964. Uh, from 1996, the municipality stopped the killing and allowed us to go ahead with the ABC program, uh, thanks to one person who was the commissioner and the mayor of the city. He said, okay, we'll shut down our, our killing centers and you go ahead with your ABC program, which we have been doing. It has been funded completely by us, by donations that we raise and by small grants that we got from the Animal Welfare Board of India. For the last five years, the Chennai Corporation, the municipality here, agreed to pay us some money, but they pay us approximately six to seven dollars per animal. And uh, that doesn't even cover 40% of the cost, actual cost to us of the operation itself. We have to catch the animal, we have to keep it there overnight initially, do the operation, keep it there for five days, vaccinate it, and then return it to the area. All this costs money, and we are not counting the uh, amount that is incurred by way of infrastructure, you know, kennels, we have 240 kennels for these dogs to be kept in, the dog catchers and other things. So it, it is a program that can only really succeed if the municipality step in and fund it. All right, um, we are pretty much at the end of the interview, but I want to ask one final question. Do you believe that there are any parallels between the, between managing the dog population as you have through ABC and how um, governments, NGOs, and other parties should tackle pandemics such as COVID-19? There's no direct parallel as such, but you know, it's, it's very sad that uh, it is NGOs and individuals and uh, philanthropic organizations that really have been stepping in every time there is a disaster, whether it's floods or whether it's famine or whether it's cyclones or whether it's a pandemic of COVID. Uh, the, the government really, as far as these things are concerned, must take with the responsibility of doing it. That's the reason we all pay our taxes. Mm -hmm. And it's unfair to expect an NGO to really take on this burden all the time. All right, thank you so much for your time, uh, Chinny, and for all of the fascinating answers. So thank you. Our, thank you very much. Our next interview will be tomorrow um, at 1.30 p.m. with Dr. Mark Jones of Born Free. So I hope to see a lot of the same people attending that one. Again, Chinny, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.